Okay, hello everyone. Welcome again to the lecture of the Indonesian value and ideologies. I will continue the class. I will continue to give a lecture on the lecture number 10. The topic is pop culture and the competing ideologies in Indonesia. It's actually during the uh, season, this is the semester, will be the last lecture. And it's talking about the pop culture. You might have a question in the beginning. Why then we have to take a consider of a pop culture? Or what is pop culture what I mean? Here, it's quite interesting. In the process of modernization of Indonesian society, uh, particularly after uh, after during the, the new order under the Suharto regime, when the Indonesian society, a state and a country of Indonesia, is accelerated into a more modern country in some ways. Of course, it's still a process to go there. Apart from that, is the growing number of, we call it, pop cultures. Pop cultures is mean the culture and the way of living, or more importantly, the cultural product, the culture industry, the culture that is a product of the industry, like a movie, like a television drama, music, like a, you might include kind of a cartoon, the book cartoon for kids, and others sometimes relate with the entertainment industry. Within some ways, they try to reproduce the culture of the society for the main purpose with a primary goal for profit, for economic profit, which means actually it's a profit only. It's more a capitalism industry. But then, in the context of Indonesia, the pop culture is the arena, is the place, is the location where any kind of values ideologies, some uh, like a way of life was in competition in shaping the society. You know, from the previous class, when we're talking about the secularism, Islam and democracy and Pancasila, I'm sorry, not democracy. Um, we try to conclude the way the country, the society, the state from the beginning, it's always in competition between the local tradition, local culture, Islam, and then and the influence of Westernization during the colonial time, which is all of them try to influence of the very fabric of the Indonesian society in the modern time. That process is actually happening or continues happen during the the current day, the contemporary era, the modern day today, as manifested in the pop culture. So in this lecture, uh, let me explain to you. I will again to remind you or try to revisit the Kurt legacy from the Clifford Kurt. During the previous lecture, I already told you about this, but the, the three uh, variant, uh, three model, three group within the Indonesian society, call it as a priyayi, the modern elite, the high class, the westernized educated people, the santri, with the peoples Muslim, and the abangan, the nominalist Muslim with the struggle for life. The way the three model or three variant of within the Indian society is of course a lot of uh, critic of the Kurt uh, study but it's still relevant in general way to explain the the pattern the differentiation within the Indian society and later on I will follow up the way this kind of three variant influence or manifested in the competition within the pop culture industry or the upper middle class pop culture, lower middle class pop culture, and more Islamist, Islamicized pop culture. 
and the way to understand these competing identities with the Indonesian society. Okay, let me start with the Kurt legacy. The Clifford Kurtz is American anthropologist. He studied uh, Indonesian society, or more precisely, in East Java. So mostly he referred to the, the Javanese society. And he published a book in 1964 or later on. Uh, the title is The Religion of Java. Actually, the book is a part of the ethnographic study in Kadiri in East Java. In there, uh, Gertz then formulate three groups of the Indonesian society in general, or more precisely, the Muslim Indonesian society, or more precisely again, the Muslim Javanese society. The three group is a Priyayi, Santri, and Abangan. The Priyayi is represent the Javanese aristocrat, Western educated elite, the everyone group who living in the high class. But in some ways, they have a, a more adorned, more proud with the Hindu Buddhist legacy within the Javanese society. While actually, uh, nominally or you know, officially, they are Muslim. The another group is Santri, the Javanese pure Muslim. It's a group, uh, about a bit, some of them is an affluent group, but they're living in the high class, but they're very pure Muslim. They're practicing Muslim. They're devoted Muslim. The other group is Abangan, the Javanese commoners, the nominalist Muslim, which is officially they are Muslim, but they're not so care with the religion, but and more, uh, more take concern or the economic aspect as they struggle for life. They usually, in terms of the social class, are living in the bottom of the uh, social class, social hierarchy, stratification of the Indian society in general. This three group is um, is to be honest is very relevant. Even any kind of study about Indonesian society is always referred to good uh, typology, which is, is still living. There is some kind of a priyayi, some of is uh, santri, some abangan. The priyayi is mostly there is where some uh, more educated elite. They are living in good place, the affluent place. There were different tastes of cultures. They're different position and politics, and vice versa. The santri and the opposite also have the different way of life, tradition, the class, and the taste in terms of culture. Well, the Abangan, the lower one, they often have the taste of culture and the different way to live in, in the society in general. It still very exists in the Indian society in general today. Look in the Priyai cultures. Mostly they adore the high culture of Java, which is influenced by the pre-Islamic Hindu and Buddhist tradition. Culture is preserved as the tradition, Java at the highest level of language. You know, if you live in Yogyakarta, you might identify uh, three levels of Javanese language. The Kromo Ingil, the highest levels, the, uh, the middle one, and the lower one. The Priyayi mostly, they adore the beauty, the high, and the elite of the Javanese tradition, if they familiar or they can practice the higher level of Javanese language. And there is a lot of kind of a celebrate tradition, life course, to, to celebrate the life course, like Islamatan, Kenduri, and everything else. And, and in terms of marriage, usually they're very concerned about the, what call it, the bibit, bebet, and bobot or the equality uh, of social stratification equality between uh, the bride and the groom. This is all to be coming from the uh, quite equal uh, family. They are not uh, supposed to marry between the, the Priyayi and the Abangan and with the uh, Sandri for some reason. What is important in the Priyayi culture is Mostly they against the Islamization, which is called it as the process of Arabization, the, the growing influence of the Middle Eastern tradition, the Arab 
offer the Japanese society. You live in Jogja, you may be familiar with Wayang. Wayang is part of the uh, high tradition of uh, Riyai in, but I'm not sure today. But then at the time, what is important is they kind of are like an Indonesian nationalist project. With Indonesia, should be not Islamic, it should be secular. And they adore pre Islamic and pre colonial era, the glory kingdom of Majapahit, which is very adored, Sriwijaya, and prefer Sanskrit influenced Japanese tradition. Why? To be honest, what, the university was very priyayi in some ways. They prefer more all Sanskrit, Hindu, Buddhist legacy in the Japanese Indonesian cultures rather than the influence of the Middle Eastern Islam within the contemporary Indonesian society. Take a look here the name of the building, the Graha Sabha Pramana. I'm not sure. I think the question for the uh, domestic student, Indonesian student, for the overseas student, we're not familiar with that. The term Graha Sabha Pramana, do you know what it means? And you might asking or asking you, why Gajah Mada choose the name Graha Sabha Pramana? What kind of language it is? To be honest, for me, I have to check in the Google what this means. Graha Sabha Pramana is all Javanese word of Kavi language, which have influence from the Sanskrit India, which arrived in Indonesia and shaped the Javanese society before the coming of Islam. In Indonesia, generally, they name officially with the with the kind of a language they try to uh, you know take away or they take a distance from the influence of islam uh, and more prefer to the pre-islamic uh, legacy in developing and constructing the indonesian national identity with the graha sahabrama Graha, Pina Graha, the Istana President, the Presidential Palace, uh, Gedung Agung, and other names. You might name a lot of uh, in terms of Indonesia, but it's usually using the, the pre Islamic Sanskrit language to define the culture of the, the national uh, identity of the country. So that's kind of, I call it as the, the legacy, the manifestation of. Prayayi cultures, the Western educated elite that try to adore with the pre Islamic Hindu Buddhist Javanese tradition as authentic, original Indonesian, and try to get away or try to hinder any influence from the Middle Eastern Arabian or Islam in this way, but still keeping as a high culture. Well, Santri is quite different. You know, uh, Santri is coming from the term Santri, Islamic Madrasa. Group of pious Muslim, again, animistic, secularized, and not secularized priyayi, and very have an influence from the Islamic doctrine and Arabic tradition. Take a look on the name. It's the big person in, in the country during the, the last um, 70 years, Sukarno, Suharto, Megawati. The three names is very important figure in the Indonesian society. Sukarno is the first president, Suharto is the second president, Megawati is son of Sukarno, the daughter of Sukarno. Look the name. Mostly using the Javanese language. While Abdurrahman Wahid, the president number three, ah, number four, I mean, and then Muhammad Rais, Muhammad Amin Rais, one of the uh, previously is a child person of the National Assembly. Which is the two in the bottom was a very Arabized name, while the three others is very local domestic. So the competition can be manifested in the way they give a name of person in this Indonesian society. And today, I think if you check your name, you can take an influence. Are you 
are your family have a link with the Islamic tradition or with the Germanist tradition or other tradition, more Western or more uh, Chinese influence, the Chinese tradition, and everything else. So while well, some three here, they mostly more adore, they bring the Middle, Middle Eastern Islamic tradition to Indonesia and try to grow, construct their own one, which is uh, um, not quite linked with the pre-Islamic uh, legacy of Hindu and Buddhism, and not secularized as uh, shown with, uh, by, by the pre group. The Lotus Group is Abangan, the lower social class of the Indonesian Javanese society, not intended to higher culture. Mostly the syncretic belief uh, linked with the Islamic mysticism followed like uh, Alin and Kabatinam and against now the Islamic conservatism that is, is growing in the society and more cultural performance is more fulgor. It's, not, it's a bit okay with eroticism, female eroticism, realism, and quite direct the abana so uh that, that kind of three group what i told you have manifested during the modern time of indonesia in the construction in the production of the pop cultures let me take you to the pop culture of the indonesian society i give you the picture first picture is a roma irama uh, is the person that is responsible to promote Dangdut. One of the articles uh, I ask you to review in, is about Dangdut. Dangdut. Dangdut is kind of a genre of music that is uh, very popular in Indonesia and the mix between Indian, Malay, and some from Java and some of modern Western uh, musical instruments. They have a very peculiar tradition and Roma Irama is one that is uh, uh, promoting the Dangdut uh, against uh, more Western pop uh, song. In compare is a Kusplus. Kusplus is one that's like a Beatles of Indonesia if you familiar with Beatles. The group is rise during the time the Beatles are uh, very popular in, in, in the West, in Britain and around the world. Look, the, the style, which is very old, uh, is uh, 60s, uh, 70s, and they promote first more uh, pop song, uh, Western uh, influence pop song. It's quite famous. I'm not sure for your generation, for domestic student, uh, I'm not sure you are familiar with the Cosplus and Roma era. But if you go back in 70s, in 60s, and in 80s, these two groups, uh, is a very big influence within the Indonesian, more urban, more vibrant, modern society. So, the pop culture is quite important because, you know, the new order was introduced with mass media, newspaper, radio, television, cinema. And the boom of middle class, you know, the number, of the population of Indonesia was growing and uh, Indonesian prosperity, economic prosperity, that uh, benefit give benefit to the rise of the middle class. The people living more affluent, they are able to live in more modest way, and have a lot of money uh, to spend in for entertainment, for leisures, and everything else. At the first, it's quite dominated by the government during the Suharto regime. It was very strong with the nationalist project, like I told you, the Priyayi tradition or nationalist project, which is a uh, uh, they adore the pre-Islamic uh, Hindu Buddhist tradition and then a uh, bit influenced from the West as a part of the modernization, but not quite linked with Islam. And then again, after the reformation, you know, the reformacy in 19, 18, 1998, the reformacy and democratization, the pop culture is growing, but the nationalist project of Indonesia was uh, a bit declined, or the, the intensification of the project was a bit in stagnant. Uh, there is no, no kind of project anymore, more, uh, you know, appear in, in the society. But then it's becoming more open for everything to grow. We can identify first, for example, 
for the upper middle class pop cultures. There is two movie that is in the last decade is very influential in the Indian society. First is Ada Apa Dengan Cinta, or in in English is um, What's Going On with Love, and the other one is Dylan. It's quite recent. You might watch Dylan for the domestic student. Dylan and Ada Apa Dengan Cinta, Cinta or ADC, you may say that. Is part of the upper middle class pop cultures, which is uh, is a character. It's uh, you know it's characteristic. It's national, globalized, modern, and secularized. It means it target national audience. It's not uh, address specific ethnic. So crossing ethnic boundaries in Indonesian society. You know the ethnicity in Indonesia is some ways is quite uh, uh, visible between Javanese and uh, Makassar or Minang. Uh, if you visit the, the local um, area, it will be very, very appearance that different is others. So they also have an influence from the global culture, Hollywood, K-pop, Western, Bollywood, India, and everything else. And mostly they have no lead, no preference to religious symbol of hair have no religious message, or we may say more secularized. And the topic is more about urban, romance, and some horror. Roman is a more favorite in the in the upper middle class pop culture. And some now becoming more with a thriller and action. But in general, they not relate with kind of ideological contestation or religion in some ways. So the upper middle class pop culture is quite, a, quite a, you know, it's common. It's like a dominant in, in some ways in Indonesia. And we can try to identify that is uh, with other pop culture that is also uh, growing uh, in the Indonesian society today. Example here, the lower class pop culture mixed with local, national. Yes, it's a colorized, like an abangan one, simple. And some other one is uh, some have a, sexual vulgarity with a female body eroticism and in some ways they have against the islamization agenda and mostly a bit realist representing the daily life of an indonesian and quite familiar with them i show you the the symbol here was uh, the female quite famous in 2000 after the reformacy uh inul daratista uh, in the article you might read about uh, her, is the person that's uh, singing a dangdut, a dangdut singer, now becoming entrepreneurs, and, and quite famous with the dance, with the dance with a more erotic dance, uh, like a uh, like a striptease, but it's not so vulgar because it's public. So the person is she she so controversy because uh, he he face to face with the uh, Roma Irama and uh, some uh, region in Indonesia is banned her to perform because the words from the Indonesian Muslim ulama because he say that uh, the Inul dance not Inul sing but Inul dance is provoke eroticism which is again the the very value of the Islam in the Indonesian society. The other figure is Didi Kampot. This mix with the Dangdut and the Japanese uh, music. And quite famous, even he got a lot of uh, international audience in Suriname, which is, uh, uh, there is a uh, Indonesian community in Suriname. Even in, in Holland and in other, uh, in the other country and in general in, in Japanese uh, region in Indonesia. It's quite uh, famous. Even in, in Gajah Mada, some, he performed to. Diddy Kampat is quite a famous with he is a songwriter. The, the, the music, the song he sing is mostly about the, the realistic life of the Indian society, representing the struggle of life of the lower middle class society, and some of difficulty and some kind of wise, the wise idea, the, the simplicity of life, to be part of the society with the complex, with getting modern, getting difficult to life uh, because of the uh, economic repression or, or other extra. 
this this two figure represent the more call it the lower class pop cultures. I move to the more Islamicized pop cultures. I take an example of the one of a movie, Ayat Ayat Cinta, the love verses. The the movie take place in Cairo, in Al Azhar, in Cairo, in Egypt, and in Indonesia. And one is promoting the polygamy, the person marriage with with two wives. It is in some ways uh, one of the Islamic values that is allowed within Islam. I'm not talking about the polygamy, but I'm talking about the way the movie was uh, promoting more Islamic value, more Islamic family, more the Islamic cultures of the society. There, of course, is targeting the growing number of Muslim middle class. This is after the economic uh, Indonesia was going better in 80s and 90s. The number of Muslim middle class, which is, they are educated, living in the affluent level, uh, quite prosperous, and they are very pious, devoted Muslim. And this a target of Islamist pop culture. The other person is Opie. Previously, is a rock singer, but they turned into singing a religious song. This is uh, in Islam. So in line of Islamic pop culture is with the Islamization agenda in movie, music, teledrama, and others. Of course, there's some extrap and they call it a religious commodification, like a commercialization of religion. But then they're quite a success. They got a lot of uh, benefit, got of um, money from this uh, profit, got a lot of profit, economic profit. So what we're going to say about this? In the pop cultures, that is uh, uh, quite uh, apparent, visible in the Indonesian society today, we may see the competing value and ideologies. You can see like a nationalist secularist pop culture, upper middle class society, lower middle class society, local, regional pop culture with ethnic and vernacular form, Islamicized pop culture, even the, the foreign pop culture, Hollywood, Bollywood. And now, I think if you're living in Asia, in Southeast Asia, uh, the wave of Hallyu, the K pop, was a very visible. Even for me, I, I, even I enjoy the, the Korean drama. I'm not sure about you, but you might try it. What I say here, that's a, this kind of a, value and ideologies is always in competition in Indonesia, in shaping the very fabric of the Indonesian society. It means there is no one single culture in Indonesian society. There is always competition. Like I saw you in the picture, there is a lower middle class, the people from the rural, kid, rural area, the santri in the middle, and the urban, um, upper middle class, a kid in, in the city with this, uh, I saw the differences. All of them was Indonesia. And all of them have a different value and ideologies in the way they live in the society. So, okay, the concluding remark. So, the Indonesia, I reiterate the, uh, the term is introduced by the, the French historian, Denis Lombard. He said about the Southeast Asia and very term of Indonesia is a crossroad of civilization. There is a lot of influence from around the world coming, arrive, give influence, reshaping, reconstructing the very fabric of the Indonesian society. All of them is keeping an ongoing competition. There is never end. And I saw you the picture here. Is a Via Fallen, one of the very famous uh, Dangdut singer, modern Dangdut singer in Indonesia, which uh, she was performing in the ASEAN Games in 2018. You know, for me as a sociologist, I will show you quite different, uh, you know, uh, like a, the way to interpret why then 
in the very big event, international event that held in Jakarta in Indonesia, they show Via Fallen. And the way it is, Via Fallen is represent the more modern Indonesia, but not so Western. He's singing Dangdut, which is uh, some ways is proud as the one of the national uh, music of Indonesia, the country music, the very specific music. There is no Dangdut outside Indonesia. And the figure, Fiel Fallen is a Dangdut singer, but it's not coming from the lower level of the Indian society, which is mostly uh, the Dangdut singer is only um, while they sing, they also try to promote more female body eroticism, more full girl sexuality. But Fiel Fallen is quite modest. It's kind of an Indonesian nationalist project. They kind of are not so modern. They still keep with the tradition, with the local. Not so Islamic, but still Muslim. And not so, you know, serious. It's quite a, uh, you know, easy going and very active, very positive and optimistic about the futures. So the way they choose Fia Fallen is try to represent that kind of idea try to end, to mix, to accommodate all the competing ideologies that is growing in the modern day of Indonesia. So I think that's all for the lecture. And thank you. And have a safe, uh, you know, during this time. Hope we can see each other later on in other occasion. And thank you for joining the course. Uh, Again, thank you. Bye-bye.